dismiss our kids to children's worship. You guys are going to have a short one today, but if you want to head that way, you can do that. And as, you, uh, as the kids are making their way out, go ahead and pull out your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians with me. We're going to continue on in Philippians. We've had some church up in here. Amen, church? Good deal. Um, this is message number 11 in Philippians that we have uh, entitled The Fight for Joy. And uh, in particular, this morning, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 11. And uh, this very well may be the shortest sermon I have ever preached. I said it last, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, the crowd goes wild. (sighs) Could be the shortest one ever. Um, And and it may be like a 15-minute deal. And my wife is like, you've never done anything in 15 minutes. Um, Well, just hide and watch. We're going to get to the most important parts. Um, I've entitled the message today, Beyond Comparison, and I'll just begin by saying this. For those of us that are in Christ, those of us that know Jesus Christ, and we can look back on our lives before we knew him, an honest assessment, being a Christian is not always easy, is it? Um, But it doesn't compare to the way we used to be, does it? um, We look back, shouldn't we be thankful for what we have in Christ? It's beyond uh, comparison. And uh, we're going to look at this scripture, Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 11. Um, Read along with me. It's going to be on the screen as well. Philippians 3, verses 2 through 11. Paul, uh, and you remember we've we've stepped through this already, and and Paul has uh, given us a lot of encouragement in this, but he's also giving the Philippian church a warning. And and I think it's one we should heed in today's world, uh, especially when you look at the church and knowing that the church needs to be biblically focused, doing the things that Jesus Christ told us to do as the church. And we can look out in our society, and, and we don't stand as judge, but it's easy to tell that, and even the scripture said it would be like that, that there would come a day, there would be a time when even the church or some churches would not be focused on what is important. And my prayer is that this church always remains biblical. Um, And I think you see that through in the way we pray. Uh, The things we're focused on, even like the link ministry, we wouldn't support a ministry if it's not faith-based and biblically based. Um, In our songs, I mean, we're singing scripture this morning. And we get to this, and here's what Paul said. Pretty strong language to the church at Philippi. He said, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And boy, you say, man, Paul was pretty cocky. Well, I mean, he's just saying, you know, he had done a lot of things, and he had been an opposer of Christianity, and he's saying if anybody had, and he was very successful at what he did, and he's saying if anybody had confidence in the flesh, I should have. And and he goes on in the scripture, and he says about himself, in verse 5, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As to the law, he was a Pharisee. As to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. In other words, he was pretty good at keeping the law. He was a a righteous man according to the law. But verse 7 says, But whatever gain I had, I love this. I love this. I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And boy, shouldn't that be the place where our hearts are this morning? Look at me, church. Shouldn't that be where we are when we count the cost, and we look at what Christ has done for us, and we look back and we can say, you know, all that I had, all that I was focused on before I knew Christ, I counted as loss compared to the gain of knowing Christ. And, and that's what Paul said, verse 8 says, he, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. A whole lot of scripture and a little bit of time this morning. And really, if you focus in, let's let's go here today. Let's focus on verse 8. Let's look at verse 8. Paul uses a word that's really quite fascinating 
to describe his own life. He, he says, um, listen to it one more time in verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So he, he uses this word rubbish. If you've got your Bibles, you might underline that word rubbish or, or whatever your version might say or circle it. The, the Greek word for rubbish is a word, it's called scubula, and it's, uh, it's only used right here in the New Testament. And get this, I think I can say this in church. It literally means dung or excrement. Can I say that? Well, I just did. It, that's what it means. He, he says, he says I, I count it all as dung. <laughs> I love that. Compared to the privilege of knowing Christ my Lord. You know, Paul was a funny guy. He had a little bit of humor about him. And he said, I, all the stuff in my life before, I count it as dung or excrement as compared to the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, we were out in the pasture, and we were, uh, my dad had cut a, a, a go-kart track out in the pasture. He'd taken the bush hog and, and, and cut a track, and we were out there with the kids, and we were riding, and, and, um, and I was on the go-kart with, with Jake, and, and we're letting him drive, but he couldn't reach the pedal, so I'm doing the pedals and the, and the brakes. And, and he kind of leaned over to me like he wanted to tell me a secret, and, and I, I said, what is it, buddy? And he said, Daddy, don't run over the chips. And, uh, and, and, and I said, um, and I said, why am I not supposed to run over the chips? And he said, because the chips are the cow's stinky shoe shoe. And, uh, and if you run over one, uh, he, he, he said, if you run over one that's dry, it's okay. He said, but if it's wet, it's a big stinking mess. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then I said, okay, buddy. I said, well, we'll try not to do that. And then he leaned over again, and I think I can say this in church too. And he said, Daddy, besides being called Chips, it's also called Duke. And, uh, and, I, said, and I said, well, hang on, buddy. Let's not use the word Duke. Chips is okay, and you can use patties or dung. I said, but let's just stay away from Duke because your mama will get you. And um, and so anyway, is, you know, he, he used that analogy. Now, why would Paul describe his old life like that why would why would he say it's just a bunch of duke why you know why would he say it's it's excrement uh, it's 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 chips compared to knowing christ and, and 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 it's because paul had come to this point where he is a man who now realized his purpose in life he realized why he was created i mean you know paul's the same guy that wrote verses like second corinthians five seventeen that says therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, Paul got it. Paul understood. I mean, Paul wrote verses, uh, scriptures like Colossians chapter 3 that says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He said, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. You see, Paul got it. Paul, Paul understood that. And, and I guess the big question in the few minutes that we have this morning, we got about 10 more of them. Um, do you know why God put you here? Do you know why you're here right now? And that's a tough question for some people to answer. Have, have you ever wondered that? Why, why has God put you right where you are right now? Do, do you think it's by chance that you're single or you're married? Uh, do you think it's by chance that you have children? Maybe your children are at home and you're raising them right now or your children have long since moved away. Um, do you think it's by chance that you have a good job or maybe that you're in a bad situation right now? Maybe you can, with your job, maybe it, you can relate to dung in that and you're thinking, boy, that, you know, my job situation's not great. But do you think it's by chance or is there a larger purpose at work in your life and and let me ask you this let's go to a second question when, when you stand before jesus christ one day and you will remember we talked about that a few weeks ago look back at philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 just a little review we talked about this a few weeks ago therefore god has highly exalted him this is chapter 2 9 through 11 therefore god has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name so that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we spent that whole week talking about humility. There's no room for pride in God's church. Um, the thing that should mark God's church should be the spirit of humility. When people look at us, they should see a humble people who exalt Jesus Christ and then they want what we have um, because we're exalting him. 
And, and so, you know, we ask this question when we stand before him and we know that we will and we have to give an account of our lives, you know, is it going to matter? What's going to matter? A good job, a college degree, money in the bank, a lot of friends, a good reputation, successful career, the praise of others, you know, a winning record in life, a bag full of awards, you know, all these things that seem to be so important to me and to, to us and, and, and to me sometimes and we take a step back and we realize hey those things really aren't important when it's compared to the greatness of knowing Jesus Christ and we have to ask ourselves is that my life am, am I, are my priorities wrong am I focused on the wrong thing and if we're focused on those kind of things like that list I just gave then we're missing the boat uh, we really don't have much going for us because we miss the point of life um, I read a quote this week it says sooner than you think you'll be lying in a box six feet underground with grass growing over your head. You're like, thanks for encouraging this mor- us this morning, Pastor. Um, and all the things of this life won't matter at all. Someone else will have your money and your job. Your fame will fade, your glory will disappear, and everything you now own will belong to others. It's real encouraging. You will eventually be forgotten except by those people who stumble on your gravestone a hundred years from now and say, I wonder who this guy was. See, when it comes down to it, I think we have to realize this morning that only two things really matter in life. And, and uh, Dawn even mentioned it this morning. She looked at our purpose statement, God and people. That's, when it boils down to it, that's what matters, God and people, the word of God and people. And it only makes sense to build our lives around those things. And you see, Paul understood that. That's why he was able to look back and say, hey, the way I used to be, the life I used to live, I used to think that was so important. I used to think that was the way you live. And and he said, I look back now and I realize that now that I know Jesus Christ, I want to live for him and I want to serve him. I want to be all in. I I want to serve from a humble heart and a real heart. And when I realize that, it doesn't compare. I don't don't even want to go back to those things anymore. And, And we know we struggle and sin and we stumble sometimes and we fall short. But the deep desire of our heart is I don't want to walk in that anymore because I love Jesus Christ. It doesn't even compare. I got about seven minutes, so let's break it down. I don't mean like break it down like hammer time, but I mean let's break it down like the scripture um, this morning. Let's look at these verses real quick. If you're taking notes, we'll just we'll fly through this, and you can do a little homework this week and get uh, get a little deeper in it. In verses two and three, and I won't read them again just for the sake of time. You can do that um, as I'm talking. That way, you won't have to listen. You can just read. I'm just kidding. Verses two and three. What does it say? Basically, Paul's telling us watch out for false teachers. Paul's saying, beware. Um, and, and evidently, even in their time, that was real. They, there, were, there were Jewish Christians who were still teaching, even after the time of Christ, that you had to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Um, and, and so Paul was saying, that, that's not right. You don't, you, you don't have to do that anymore. It's not that the law is not important. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. The law is very important. You can't separate the Old Testament from the New Testament, vice versa. But, but Paul was saying that in order to be saved, remember, no man comes unto the Father unless he comes through who? Jesus Christ. And we know that the Bible says that the way of salvation is by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. No other way to God. And, uh, and he's saying, you look, you can't put confidence in the flesh anymore. Um, and, and so when we start talking about keeping the law and leaving Christ out, that's not biblical Christianity. Just a, just a, a, a note worth taking, religion without Christ is dangerous. And millions of people today are trusting in religion to get them to heaven. And they will stand before God one day and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because salvation is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, there, there are many people... Um, and I I feel like I've harped on it a lot lately, who may have prayed a prayer at some point. And I understand that salvation begins with uh, with surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and God drawing you and you realizing that and you know you need him. But there are many people who have prayed a prayer and never had a life change. And so um, if that's you this morning, realize that um, you you can listen to Billy Graham or David Platt or Francis Chan all you want, you can take the Lord's Supper, you can do the church stuff, you can pray a prayer and never really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so beware of the false teaching that's out there. Secondly, Paul said this in verses four through six, don't put your confidence in the flesh. Don't put your confidence in the flesh. Um, in other words, Paul is saying, you know, it's real easy to put your confidence in yourself, in other people, put your confidence in a job, in money, in a house, in a spouse. Uh, I didn't mean to make a rhyme there. Um, we can, um, <laughs> in, a mo- in a mode, in a boat, um, we, we, can do, we can do what seems like the right things, um, 
and it not be the God things, right, church? And, and Paul gives this personal illustration from his own life. If you really read verses four through six, he's giving you that illustration. He was saying, I did all the right things, um, you know, aside from Christ. He, he had the right kind of ritual. He was circumcised on the eighth day, the right race. He was an Israelite. Uh, the right family, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, the right religion, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he was uh, the right occupation, he was a Pharisee, he, 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 you know, he knew the word, the right zeal, he was, a, he was a persecutor of the church, he was saying this Jesus is a fake, this Jesus is not the real Messiah, so he did what he thought he was, was right. Um, he, he had the right morality and he had an outward keeping of God's commands, but he didn't know Jesus Christ. He didn't have that relationship. And we know the story of Paul. God changed him on the road to Damascus and, um, and, and totally changed his life. But just understand sincerely doing your best is not good enough. It's about relationship with Christ. Third thing this morning, um, verses seven and eight, look at life from God's perspective. And, and that's the third section of the passage. Paul considers his life before and after coming to Christ. He does an, a, a mental accounting, a, a draw up, kind of a spiritual gain loss statement. And, and, and on the gain side, it was just simple. He said, the gain is Jesus Christ. Um, and, and, and think about that for a second. Paul's casting aside his heritage, his, his, his years of education, his job as a Pharisee, his reputation for being this religious man. All these things that meant so much to him and, and the world would have looked at that and said, man, you're successful. You've got it going on, Paul. You, you know, you, you figured life out. I want to be like you, Paul. And Paul says he looks back on that and he says, you know, it's all dung to me. It doesn't even matter at all. It's chips and patties and stinky shoe-shoe because the only thing that matters now is knowing Jesus Christ. And, and, and why would Paul come to such a radical conclusion? Why would we read that and see that Paul it, it calls it rubbish and he, and, and, and he talks about these things of God now? You know? and, 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 and why would he call those good things rubbish? You know, It's not bad having a good job and... And, and being from a, you know, a good family and, and, and all these things, why would Paul call that rubbish? I mean, when we say the word rubbish or dung in church, we want to think about the rubbish in our lives, and we think about things like uh, angry thoughts and bad habits and pornography and sexual immorality and misconduct and idolatry and prejudice, all these things the Bible is, and certainly those things are dung. But Paul was even calling things that we might consider good stuff dung. And, 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 and so, I mean, how many, if, if, God, if, if God convicted you or somebody walked up to you and said, man, you, you got to get rid of some stuff in your life if you're ever going to really follow after Jesus Christ, how many of us would think, oh, that's right, I need to get rid of my ethnic heritage. You know, I need to get rid of, um, you know, the, the, the things I was brought up in, all, my education. I need to, you know, I need to be, I need to get rid of that. And we would never think that. We might think, I need to get rid of this certain sin. But Paul was saying, even those things are dung compared to knowing Jesus Christ. And then the last three verses, verses 9 through 11, Paul shows us that there's a new goal in life. Um, and especially verse 11, uh, it's kind of strange because Paul is, um, he's talking about a resurrection with Christ. And, and, and basically what Paul was saying, um, you know, in John 14, 6, I mentioned it earlier. You know, John said, no man comes unto the Father unless he comes through me coming through Jesus Christ. And, and, and Paul is basically saying in the scripture, you know what, I've stepped out in faith and I've trusted this. And if Jesus Christ doesn't come through for me, then that's it. My body will just rot in a grave. You know, and that's what Christianity is. It's stepping out in faith and trusting. You know what? I'm believing in Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is a liar, then he's a liar. But I, don't, I, I realize there's no other alternative. I, I trust in Jesus Christ. And then we look at God's word and we believe that, you know, and we even beyond that, we believe that he's not a liar because his word says he's not a liar. And, um, and we take that by faith. And so Paul's saying, you know, trusting in Jesus Christ completely, you know, changing your life completely. Um, you know, I was thinking about this, that I was trying to think of a good illustration. And, 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 and Paul was basically saying, look, you can't do life without Jesus Christ. You can't play the part. You can't act like a Christian and say you're a Christian, but not really 
know him. I mean, you know, people are going to figure out, figure you out. God's already figured you out. God already knows. And deep down, you know it's wrong. And I was, um, and I was trying to think, oh, what's a good way to illustrate that? And, and this morning, I was walking out of the house, and I looked over, and we got this rack that has, like, kids' backpacks and stuff hung on it. And I saw Jake's little uh, uh, preschool backpack. I saw it standing there, uh, sitting there, and, and I thought, that's it. You know, if you have a backpack, unless you've got like, like Jackson's got this big binder and he's like, it's so big. It, it's like, why did we even buy you a backpack? Because it won't fit in it. So he's carrying an empty backpack to school and he's got a binder that he's carrying here. And I'm like, why did we spend money on a backpack if your binder won't even fit in it? And I thought, that's the analogy. That's it. And that's, that's, so many people do that in the Christian life. You know, we're toting around this Christianity thing and we've got the backpack on our back and really the binder needs to be in the backpack. You know, you got to be one with Christ. You can't, you can't do two different things. Um, and, and so Paul is saying, there, you know, there's two goals in life. You can't be this Sunday, Wednesday Christian. You can't be this casual acquaintance with Christ. And he's saying, you know, there, and he, he told us right here in the Scripture that his two goals in life were to be found in Christ and to know Christ, to know him intimately and to know him more. Um, and I think he understood what Mark talked about in Mark eight thirty six when he says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And so I think the big question this morning, short and sweet, is do we realize what Paul is saying to us here, that there's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, that the, 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 the old life is nothing compared to the newness of knowing Christ. And if you're living in the old life now, and Paul's saying, you need, you need to get a new one. You need to come to Christ because it's the most important thing you'll ever do in life. You see, Paul spent his life, spent years and years doing things that didn't matter. And I'm sure he wished he could have had that time back. Um, and we even sang it this morning in that song, Fire, Fire Fall Down, I'll Never Be the Same. And, you, and that's the way Paul was. He met Jesus Christ and he was never the same. And if you know Jesus Christ, you'll never be the same. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And some of you don't. And that's exactly what you need. And so the big question this morning, have you embraced Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus? Are you changed? If you don't know Jesus, then understand that you're in danger of losing your eternal soul. We're going to close out a little bit different. I'm going to change things on Jake. Uh, you guys may have had a great song. But let's just close in prayer this morning. And uh, we'll give an invitation like this, okay? Uh, Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, we praise you for your word. Lord, we thank you that, um, Lord, that we can look at scriptures like this and see evidence of what it means to have a changed life. And so, Lord, my prayer this morning as we, um, as we pray right now, Lord, is just to give an invitation to everyone in this room. Lord, um, in, 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 in a couple of ways. First of all, Lord, I want to pray for believers in this place this morning, Lord, for folks all over this room who know you, um, Lord, who have a relationship with you. But Lord, maybe there are some sin struggles. Lord, maybe there are some things, even as we pray right now, that need to be laid down at the foot of the cross. Lord, some things that we need to surrender to you and totally give over to you. And Lord, maybe it's those things that we've gone back and forth on. Lord, we've sat on the fence and we've said, Lord, I'm not gonna do this again. I can't believe I'm here again. Why am I doing this? And Lord, and then we choose that sin. Um, instead of you. Lord, I pray we'd be found choosing you. Lord, make us um, at a place where we fall deeper and deeper in love with you, where we depend on you more and seek after you. Um, Lord, the second part of this prayer and this invitation, Lord, is, um, is for the lost that may be in this room. Lord, I believe every time we meet, um, Lord, that you bring people into this place that, um, that don't know you. Lord, when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, they do not know what it means to have a personal relationship with you. They do not understand. Lord, Lord, in other words, we talk about standing before you, and they know in their hearts deep down that when they stand before you one day and give an account of their lives, that the reality is, is they, that they don't know you. And Lord, this is not a scare tactic, but it's reality. Your word says for people found like that that you will say, depart from me for I never knew you. And Lord, you do that out of your justice, not out of hatred, not because you're not a fair God. You're a just God. Um, and, and so Lord, I pray for the lost in this room this morning. Lord, you do the saving. We don't do that. Um, but Lord, we can do the praying. And I pray, Lord, that you would draw those people to you. I pray that walls would come down. Lord, I pray, uh, we've prayed this prayer over and over in the life of this church over the last 10 years. Lord, that you would take hearts that are hardened like stone 
and that you would turn them to hearts of flesh that are willing and ready to receive your word. And God, that you would draw people into you and that they would be saved. And so, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that's in that boat this morning, um, Lord, that they would realize their need for you, God. They would come running to the foot of the cross, seeking you, realizing that is the most important thing in life, not the other stuff they're sold out to, but that's the most important thing. Um, God, I continue to pray for this church. That's a part of this invitation as well. Um, Lord, I continue to pray for this church, God, that we would be biblically focused, Lord, that we would point people toward you. And God, that this, uh, this, this, uh, this congregation, Lord, this body of believers, this fellowship, God, would be uh, a lighthouse in this community, God, that it would be a shining light in a dark world. In a community, Lord, that we have assumed a lot of times where a lot of people know you. And Lord, I just continue to go back to the fact that a lot of churches does not always equal a lot of sold out believers. And so Lord, I pray that we would distinguish between the two and we would realize, Lord, that you are calling people to salvation and repentance and real relationship. So Lord, that's the invitation this morning. Um, And so Lord, I pray that in our own time, Lord, as we dismiss from this place today, Lord, if people need to respond to that, that they would do it. Lord, if people need to talk with someone, they would come and find me or one of our staff members or one of our deacons or one of our prayer team members, one of our leaders, a life group leader, whoever. Lord, and they would come and talk to us and just share their hearts. And uh, whether it be uh, repenting of a sin or whether it be, I don't know Jesus Christ, would you tell me how? Um, Lord, we're going to be there for them. So, Lord, we put all this before you today. Lord, we're going to close our worship service like this, putting this prayer before you and asking you to go with us as, as we, the church, step out of these doors, out into the community, that we would continue to be the church on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday before we come back again. Lord, so we pray this in Christ's name. We put it in your hands. And God's people said together, amen.